Hello and welcome to another Build a Soil YouTube FAQ video. Today we've got season six and we're on FAQ number three. And as always, I'm gonna open it up and get started right away. First question is from Rookie. Rookie says, I did my first seed run and I am swimming in seeds. Two whole plants fully seeded, oh no. Can you possibly give, on, give advice on how to mass separate seeds from flower? Full shucking, I didn't even bother keeping any flower. So you can shuck over like a trim bin and that has the mesh in there and so maybe you can at least collect some keef from it. You could wash what, what's left over after you shuck it. But if it was your first seed run, fully seeded, so I guess you crushed it. And now you need advice on how to mass separate the seeds. Okay, well this I can definitely answer. I was just thinking, man, you didn't mean to get that many seeds. A couple different ways. Um, the best way is to get a seed shucker, basically. It looks like a wooden box and it looks like a maze. It has basically airflow and it has a place to put the seeds and then it leverages this maze of wood to move the seeds through it and leave the actual remainder. Now at home, what we normally do, it's kind of like separating the, the wheat from the chaff depending on how important it is that you collect every single seed. So a lot of people will end up taking the seeds and breaking all the material down so that there's likely to be lots of seeds and lots of dried green material. And then you separate that so it's not fully branched. You basically strip it all into a tub or a bucket. From that point, you can run a fan and you can run a fan and do like a test batch, run it on high speed and see how well that does. You might need to go to medium depending on your fan speed. And then you're gonna put a tub below that's empty, you'll have a bucket, and then you're gonna run the airflow basically through the zone where you're gonna be dumping all of your seed with the green material in it. The whole goal is to drop it using gravity, and you're gonna drop it straight into the bucket, but it's gonna go through the area where the fan is blowing, and that's gonna blow away all the really light green material and some of the light white seeds, and only allow the heavier seeds to drop directly into the bucket. So that's one way to do it. You can look up YouTube videos on separating the wheat from the chaff and come up with a couple of ideas on your own. I basically have stuck to the small methods like that. I'll end up just crushing them and I'll go through each separated labeled little bin and I'll carefully move them. So that takes a lot of time. Another consideration that people do is, man, I forget how they do it. I swear, it was like a drill and an attachment, but you can actually whip without hurting your seeds, all of that dried material to really break it down before you start to separate it. And so uh, do some research. I'm not an expert breeder or anything like that. So I've done only small scale and I hope that helps answer your question. And if not fully answering it, hopefully it just gives you uh, the right direction to look for because there's people that have some great responses to this. Uh, Baboon says, hey, I was just wondering what those, with those moisture meters, how did you come to the conclusions to stick it in the top? I know with cocoa, they're like an inch and a half off the bottom to read the moisture. Always love the content. Okay, so that's a pretty good question. Um, in hydro, I'm guessing that you're talking about the different EC and moisture meters that they use as part of a sophisticated irrigation system. And there's different methodology there. They're really probably trying to get to the bottom so they're not overwatering. And so in a cocoa core setup, in like a drain to waste or depending on the table you're using, if you read on the bottom, that's gonna give you a pretty accurate reading for that location. So all that matters is that when you set up your irrigation, you're not trusting one reading from the top and one reading from the, bro from the bottom and treating them the same. It may be that if you're reading the top number, you're okay with it getting slightly drier because you've set that up with the knowledge that it's, that it's moisture down deep. Now in living soil, I'll explain, the eco whip meter is the one that you're referring to. They actually carry two now. One is for the top and that's how I came up with that. It's designed to be used on the top. We were considering cutting little like slits in the grow bag with a knife and inserting an EcoWit into the side down low. But what we found was that EcoWit created a new version with a longer cable and you can actually bury it down low. Then you can get top and bottom readings. Initially, the EcoWit moisture meter reading the top was only so that we could make sure that we didn't water to run off when we watered, but when the top started to dry out where the EcoWit was, we could go back in and irrigate. So we're never really deep watering we're only watering when the top would start to get a little dry and that would keep the bottom totally in check. And since we weren't ever getting runoff, we weren't worried that it was over wet down low. And by the time we watered the top, that would mean the, the bottom was getting wet. So it works pretty well, just using the top reading and learning to train yourself from that. But to share the data, I found, I found it great to have both of those eco -whip meters. I really don't think you need to use these across the board in every pot. Maybe it'd be great data, but it's kind of a lot of money. I think that they're great to use to train you, train your eyes, 
train the weight and feel, all those things based off those moisture meters. And then if you have a few, you can move them around and you can get kind of a different feel on which container is doing what as you start to learn these things. Otherwise, the tensiometers that are offered by Bluemat, they, you can attach that same tensiometer top to a three inch carat, a nine inch carat. So there's many different ways to get readings from different depths when using the tensiometer. So either way, no matter what, bottom, top, middle, all of that could be important data. Where we came up with that is just EcoWit recommends to put it in the top with the battery. That's how it was designed. And it was a perfect introduction into sharing data between customers instead of just saying, here's how much you water, right? Because there's so many parameters with moisture and plant size and humidity and all those. So anyways, thanks for asking. Uh, Dan, thanks for all the great info. Question, I made soil three years ago and I used rice holes for my aeration. I know they break down over time and provide silica to the soil, but I was wondering how long that took. Was thinking I'd add pumice eventually to make up for the holes that break down, but wondering how long that takes. Thanks. This depends on a variety of factors, how biologically active your soil is, how big the plant size is in comparison to the container size, and how many runs you do per year, meaning is it constantly moist? Are there dryback periods? Are there worms in there? Um, but I'll just give you some general principles. I've seen it take one to two years to start to break down. So it's not like on your first run, all the rice holes are gonna be gone. And for a while I was thinking, man, these rice holes being silica last a very long time, but years later you can see them start to break down and they don't act the same. So for build a soil recipes, we typically use, let's say 25 to 45% aeration, depending on what we're making. And the target original was one third, so 33% aeration. And of that, I would use like 20% pumice. So it lasts for the long term. And that 13.33% could be the rice holes. So the idea was, add at least half of your aeration in pumice, maybe a little more, maybe three quarters of your aeration in pumice and do a smaller amount in rice holes. But here's the thing, it all works and I think you'll be fine. And I don't really think there's a particular need for aeration once the bed gets no-tilled and you have roots in there and worms in there, it's possible that you don't ever need to go back and add it because that would obviously require tilling up your bed and mixing it all together. So that's totally up to you. But for a ballpark, I would say one to two years for those rice holes in a soil bed situation. Let's see, next question, Deegan. I'm curious about cocoa core. I hear what it's like, but would like to see it applied. Would you consider a cocoa quadrant? No, um, we don't do cocoa core, that's hydroponics. And I think maybe what you're asking about is, could we mix soil using cocoa core? And we also don't do that. One of the reasons why is we've created a system that really works and it's based on the peat moss for the potting soil. And Coot told us a long time ago, peat moss was a better way to go. Here in the United States, it's more sustainable. And we do have a write-up on the discussion of peat versus cocoa core at buildasoil.com, educational ingredients to avoid. I'm gonna be updating that report, removing some of the hyperlinks on the bottom and, and just doing a better job explaining, but we've been conglomerating or pooling up this information for a while. And so I think it's important to discuss it, especially when you're new. It's hard, there's so many conversations. And just like with human health, one person will say one thing, one person will say another. And so cocoa core can certainly be used to build living soil. We just don't like it as much. And so in my experience, if you were to use cocoa core for a living soil, you'd have very similar results that you'd have from peat moss. And so that's just why we don't do it. So a good question, duck, duck, goats. I'm able to go and collect pumice from the beach, but it is large rounded stones, one to two inches or larger. Could I rinse them and use them or smash them up first? This is for large raised beds. Yeah, if it's pumice, use it. My thought initially would be like, what type of water is it sitting in? Is it something where it looks kind of gross and stagnant? Then cleaning it may be in order. Otherwise, just breaking it up into pieces, if it's super lightweight and floats in water and you're sure it's pumice, they're probably just smooth because they've been smoothed by the action of the water. But that'd be awesome. Depending on the water, maybe some sodium, right? If it's actually at the actual beach. But I would collect that pumice. You could break it up. Another product that we used to carry was called Grow Stones a long time ago. They were made from recycled glass and they would expand them and they had huge ones called lift and they would use them at the bottom of the container. So you could use the one to two inch stones. You could break some of those up into like quarter inch, half inch stones and some of the fines would go into your soil mix as well. So I don't think there's a way you could really go wrong. If there's a whole bunch of big stones, it's gonna displace a lot of soil. And so it might be easier to break them down smaller so that you could disperse the volume of pumice slightly more in your soil. But honestly, I think it would work. So because I've not done it, I'm gonna urge you to err on the side of the caution and maybe whip up a small test batch and put a plant in. Just because if it's totally saturated in sodium and it hasn't been rinsed very well and you break it up and use it, it could affect the soil test from the beginning, but I could be off on that. 
I just know when it's new, I take a little bit of precaution and I try and use my brain to think, is there anything from the location that I harvested this that could cause a problem? Um, but my gut wants to tell you, yes, just use it. It's pumice, it would be awesome. So good question. All right, Truth, do you expect to be able to reuse the AutoPot XXL fabric pot for multiple runs or would reamending between runs also involve a new fabric pot. Thanks for your dedication to this channel and making the living soil way convenient. Um, you're welcome. And truth, I would say I would totally reuse the AutoPot XXL multiple times if I wanted to. I would treat this as a Build-A-Soil classic method. That size is good enough to no-till in my opinion. And so when you do the top dressing, the Build-A-Soil Light and 3.0, they're gonna wick all the way to the top, no problem. And because of that, they'll keep your top dressing moist. You can build a little bit of mulch layer on there. When you harvest your plant, all you have to do is cut out with a knife or wiggle loose if it's been sitting a while, that main stalk. And you don't really have to pull it out. It's just that that's where your next plant needs to go. And so don't worry about it. Dig out a little bit, put your next plant in there, and I would just rock it. And eventually it's gonna work really well because it'll get clean water from down below, just like in the earth box. At the bottom of your soil pot will be soil that's a little more devoid of nutrient and it'll be easy access to clean water where on top, once you transplant, there'll be feeder roots in the top of the AutoPot XXL accessing the food. And when it's not mixed in, it doesn't have to be in perfect balance. So there's no reason to go get a soil test when the majority won't be perfectly balanced. It'll be light and the top will be the fertility layer. And we see this work well in beds. There's no reason in my mind this wouldn't work well in an AutoPot XXL. In fact, I think AutoPot even shows that nutrient buildup can occur in the top layer because it's sub-irrigated. And so our situation, that'd be ideal. That's where we want that fertility. Only thing you may run, to, uh, run into is if you pack it full and you're top dressing and mulching leaves and stuff in there and you go to plant your next plant, you may be out of room. You could always scrape the mulch layer off, remove a tiny bit of soil, transplant, put some mulch back. So there may be some management given that it's slightly smaller than the normal no-till container, but something tells me it would work really well. And I think you could go many, many, many runs before you'd have to you know, dump the pot out and investigate it. So let me know how it works for you. I think you're gonna love it. So the doctor says, in regards to the XXL Auto Pot, when filling it with soil, could you put in something like a three inch pipe and fill the pipe with straight peat moss, then fill the rest of your container with soil, then remove the pipe, leaving the peat moss in to act as a wicking chamber. Would this help with wicking higher up? Cheers, love the content. Man, I'm sure you could do lots of stuff. You could even put like a wicking rope down there so that it runs up there. But I think what was happening in what I believe you're referring to is in the four x four, we had one container that didn't wick all the way to the top. That was based on the soil recipe. It had far too much drainage, over 50% drainage and a high level of rock dust. The reason we did this is to create a mix that was much more challenging to overwater. And I didn't intend it to be used in the tray to grow, but I decided, or sorry, in the auto pot, but I thought, let's do it anyways. Let's see if it actually works well. And it didn't wick to the top. So all I would do would be go with a regular soil recipe, like build a soil light, it'll wick all the way to the top. You don't need to insert any special tubes or anything. And I think that you'll be good to go. So hopefully that answers your question. If you did have a soil that was more like a house plant cactus mix that was super high in drainage like that, and it wasn't wicking all the way to the top and you wanted to try and put the tube in, I think it would work, but I think it's kind of overcomplicating it. And peat moss can go hydrophobic if it gets dry. Auto Pot makes another one I'll show you. I think I've got the box back here. Now I put it in my office, but they make like an octopus that goes on top of your soil and it does use fabric as the wick. So you could probably do something like that from the top, but realistically, I don't think it's needed if you just get the soil recipe right. All right, Obadiah the Obtuse. I was just listening to Future Cannabis Project episode with Miles, but I was thinking about something that was said. So Miles is Miles from uh, Weed Should Taste Good for Manthid Plant Extracts. My question is, if I expose my plants that I intend to flower to the Arizona sunshine in vegetative state, Will the UV exposure during veg carry over to flower in for cannabinoid production? Like intentional light stressing in veg to prime the plant for flower? I don't know the answer, but I'm gonna say no. And the reason why is I feel like it's kind of like stressing your child and then hoping that the adult benefits from that. And it may despite you, but I don't think it's the best way to go. I think that what we wanna do is have good light throughout throughout the entire process. Miles was probably discussing how cannabinoids act as a protection and so the UV could in increase that amount of, of resin that's being created. There's also more information coming out about the trichome head and how it's full of biology. And that biology may be creating nitrogen for the plant 
and the plant is moving super oxidizers through the sugars in the middle to actually shoot the bacteria that's in there with super oxidizers to get them to create the nitric acid. And so if you look up Dr. White and his explanation of the trichome there, there may be many other reasons besides just the UV protection that we're getting trichomes. And so because I feel like as someone who's done this a long time, the more I learn, the less I know, and that there's probably multiple causation. I don't think it's just the UV that's causing that. And therefore, I don't believe, believe using sunlight vegetation and then switching it back to indoors would have a carryover effect. I think that the trichome production would be based on the new light that you're flowering under. However, it could make for healthier veg. I think the sun is the best light, obviously. So I would encourage you to use it, but going from in to out and out to in, in my personal opinion, from veg and then flowering indoors, I don't think there's gonna be a UV stress trained response that's gonna help your trichromes, uh, trichomes later. So interesting question. I don't know if I answered it properly, but I did my best. So I hope you appreciate that Obadiah. Next question, the O. I got an oddball question. Could you use vaporized bud for an amendment? Absolutely. So if it's vaped, obviously you're gonna remove some of the oily component. You're gonna remove some of the material, but you still have the carbon and some of the potassium and some of the other benefits that come in the actual ground up flower material. And so while I don't think it'd be full of lots of nutrition, and since it was vaped, it may not be full of other things that could be of benefit. Like it's not like a living chop and drop, it's dead, it's been vaped, but it's still biomass. And I still think it would provide some material. And the other thing you could do is work it through a worm bin. So you could just feed all your vaped material to a worm bin. You could also, like if you have an ashtray for J's, you could use that through the worm bin. Lots of ways to use this organic material. Some people like when we reference using roots for roots and green leaves for green growth and flowers and fruit for flowering when it comes to fermentation, I've seen people top dress. In fact, uh, Matt, my buddy, Matt Davenport, I've seen him do it before. I'm not sure if he still does it or if it was just for fun, but we were all trying lots of different things. And I saw him use those little chamomile flowers. You can get in bulk all organic and make tea from, or you can grow your own chamomile and get a million flowers. And he was top dressing with those. And I thought, man, that makes a lot of sense. They, it's a good biomass material. It's from a flower. It smells great. Um, so I think you could totally use it for an amendment. Would it be worth the effort? I don't really think so. But as far as instead of throwing it in the trash, absolutely. All right, last question. RT says, hey, Jeremy, I love the content and the products. A question about storing buds. Do you keep them on the stem or do you break them off into individual buds? Oh, this is a great question. So if I have like an A bud and it's got a nice top that's a fully connected nug and it starts to have nugs nested into it that are on their own individual little branches. I'll break off each nug on the main stalk until I get to the top and then I'll break that off so the top nug falls off. That's about all I do. I don't leave them fully on the stalk. Now you absolutely could, but I like to remove most of the leaf material and most of the stalk material so that I can balance the moisture now that I've already done the long, slow dry. So hopefully that helps answer your question. That's what I personally do. And that wraps up the FAQ for season six, number three. And as always, I really appreciate you answering, or sorry, as always, I really appreciate all of you asking these questions uh, because we get so many on there that it's hard to interact with each one. And then I want these questions to live on so that if you ask a really good question and it helps many other people, maybe they can benefit from these FAQ videos. So that, that's the goal. And I'd love it if you keep posting up questions on all of the videos, and I'll be sure to keep doing these FAQs so that I can answer them directly. Um, thank you so much. As always, subscribe to the channel. It really helps as we are a private channel, and so we don't get shared by YouTube. We don't get to monetize it through YouTube, and so when you actually subscribe to it, it helps our rating go up and people find the videos easier. As always, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, I'll see you on the next Build a Soil video.